Good morning, everyone. I'm John Clairbaud. I've come to tell you about my new booklet, Data Fitting with Non-Stationary Statistics. Formerly, I called this the Non-Stationary Signal Tutorial, but that was far too narrow a topic. A signal is just a single signal, whereas I'm dealing with a whole bunch of signals. And furthermore, I'm going to even have vector value <laughs> signals. And we're going to be solving inverse problems. That's the data fitting part of it. So there's a lot to do. I'm going to cover a lot of ground in a 50 page booklet and maybe a 30 minute talk. Let's get started. The word non-stationary, wave fields are non-stationary when their arrival direction changes with time or location. Their spectrum changes with the angle of emergence of this wave. There's lots of things you can do with what I'm going to teach you. Many researchers use what they call inverse theory, in which they are expected to provide an inverse covariance matrix. And the inverse theory doesn't teach you how to find the inverse covariance matrix, and that's what I'm, one of the many things I'm going to do right here. Our main tool is going to be the prediction error filter. Prediction error filters resemble partial differential equations, but as you can see from the table, they are kind of the opposite. It's going to be the heart of our ability to deal with this conflict between Fourier space and physical space. In the non-stationary world, we presume that there is a natural ordering of the regression equations. We begin from a satisfactory solution and then a new regression equation arises. Well, maybe we put that at the bottom of the stack of regression equations. And uh, we're going to use that to update our solution. And we're going to learn from practice just how far to update the solution. The methodology will be kind of really different from the classical technology. Classically, you have a residual. You put it into a penalty function. And then you find a gradient. And then you ask a solver, a conjugate gradient or something, to steepest descent to find it, find you the solution. Now, with non-stationarity, there kind of like is no solution. The solution is changing all the time. And so what we're going to do, we're going to start by modeling. And then it's really easy to write the adjoint. If you got the modeling code, it's really easy to write the adjoint code, or at least it's straightforward to write the adjoint code. We're going to put the residual into the adjoint, and then we're going to decide how far to go. We're going to learn this from experience. We're going to have an epsilon, which is going to be the jumping distance. So this, this stuff is so simple that I can cover a dozen different applications in like a 50, 60 page booklet in maybe 30 minutes. So let's get started. Uh, st statistics, there's a form of field called statistics and they analyze how you should be doing things. And they say when you take your residuals, you shouldn't just minimize your residuals. They say you need to make them independent and identically distributed or IID. Now in practice, what this means so we're supposed to take the residuals and scale them all to be about the same size in physical space and make them all about the same size in forward space. In other words, scale them and filter them. Scaling in physical space is easy, but scaling in Fourier space, we need to use a technology called prediction error filters. So let's start by looking at a filter program. Well, here's a little program that does filtering. And uh, here's, it runs over all time, runs over all lags. And here's the filter, A of tau. We have lag, and here's the data, t minus tau, and it produces the filter output. But we're going to deal with a special kind of filter called a prediction error filter. Here it'll, it'll have this one in the beginning, and it'll have a bunch of adjustable coefficients after that. And what we're going to do is we're going to start changing this filter as we move along. Now, there's an important property of the prediction error filter. I need to tell you, if the prediction is doing a good job, this one is is putting out this, the, the data that you got to begin with, and that this is trying to destroy it. You're trying to get the minimum energy out. So if the prediction is doing a good job, the output will be white. This is going to be proven in the appendix to the book, but it's well known that the output of a prediction error filter tends to be white, and there's, that's important. <laughs> okay, so let's look at the program that does the prediction error filtering. Here we have... Uh, this is the same equation I told you about a few minutes ago. And what's happening here? It's doing the opposite. Here, here the 
the output was in time space and here the input is in time space. Here the input was in lag space and here the output is in lag space. So this thing is, this first line is like a matrix multiply. The matrix is t minus tau and it's multiplying by this vector function of tau. And the second one is also, second line is also like a matrix multiply, but it's just the opposite. Where, where t went out, t comes in. Where tau went out, tau goes, tau went in, tau goes out. And so this is the filter perturbation. And we'll scale it by epsilon. We don't know how far to go. Let's take this, uh, this update line out of this program and stick it in alongside some equations. Here's the update line. And what it's really saying is we're going to change the filter by an epsilon and a residual and then the lag function, the, the lagged input data, which the lagged input data, I'm going to call it capital D. So the, the output, before you do the updating, is just A dot D. And after you do the updating, A plus delta A dot D uh, expressed can be simplified to this or adjusted to this. Then you have to remember that the, the residual, the residual is just a dot d, so you can factor this thing, and you can see that the residual output a dot d gets smaller. This number is less than one for a large range of epsilons. This number is less than one, so this says you've improved the output. I call this kind of magic, and it was a result of a lot of hard, hard gained knowledge. There's a, an appendix in the book which derives this using lots of calculus. It took me a long time, and I needed a lot of help. Okay. And it talks about the whiteness here. It says the PEF output is white. And let's go on. Let's, let's look for some missing data at the same time we're finding the prediction error filter. That's a nonlinear problem. So one of the smartest guys I've ever known came up with a new general purpose nonlinear solver for our lab. And he said, give me a simple test case. So I said, how about this one? Simultaneous estimation of a prediction error filter and its missing data. And he said, that's too tough. No, but I'm going to do, and this is a smart guy. Now I'm going to show you how easy that problem is. It may not be easy to understand it, but it's really easy to solve it. Okay, so here we have time running to minus infinity to plus infinity. We have a bunch of loops over filters and stuff. And you've already seen this line here. It says the residual is the data being, the lag data being convolved with this filter. You've already seen the update. I did not highlight the update. That's what you saw before. That's the previous equation you saw before. But now we're going to update the data. So if data is missing, only one data is missing, then we are going to update the data that's missing. And you have to look and make sure that I've written the adjoint of the first line. This first line has two adjoints, one for updating the filter and the other is for updating the data. So why do we know that this is the adjoint? Well, the output is the res residual in time space. And here the input is residual in time space. And here the input is a function of t minus tau, and here the output is a function of t minus tau. So we know that the operation is a transpose, and in fact, the operator is the filter. Okay, so this data update may not be easy to understand, but it's a logical update because the residual is passed into the adjoint. Ah, wonderful, huh? Now, it is an update program. It doesn't find you the answer without you passing this data through the program many times. And uh, you might also need to run it backwards through the data, fil try filtering backwards. I don't have any experience with this, and I wish, <laughs> I wish one of our, I don't know how people can avoid doing this problem. It's, it's like an, it's like, <laughs> It's like you, you can you can solve this in a in an afternoon easily. Okay, so let's go on. Here's here's an example that I did this one a long time ago in the stationary world. At the top, here's some, some given data. There's a missing data point in between these two. There's missing data points on both sides, and uh, you you work this thing through. And as I did it in the stationary world, and you get all this interpolated data. And I think it, it's beautiful interpolation. I, I kind of love it uh, because it looks like it's the solution to a differential equation, which, which it really is. And here's the, here's the PEF that came out of it. Uh, you were not going to get nice interpolations like this out of linear interpolation or cubic interpolation or sink interpolation. Here's another one, which is, uh, it shows that we can interpolate beyond aliasing. Now, I don't have much time today. I don't want to dwell on choosing the step size, but I do want to tell you one important thing, how to choose the epsilon 
the epsilon is really the inverse of a length. And what's that length? What's the meaning of that length? Well, how big a region would you consider to be, uh, should be stationary within a region of a certain size? Well, that's lambda, and the size of that is given in pixels. If lambda is 200, then epsilon is a half a percent. I don't want to dwell on a hyperbolic penalty function and other other ways of doing things, but you could, for example, we can do the L1 norm problem. We can solve the L1 norm problem. Uh, you just have to take your residual and you have to apply the signum function. That is, all you do is look at the polarity of it, and then you put that into the adjoint. So it's easy to switch back and forth between all the different norms. and just, Different norms don't make things any harder. You don't have to do things by least squares if you don't want to. A little off talk topic, but I do want to tell you about this function here. This function here is the earth response for a constant Q earth. And this function begins at zero and it gets a very steep acceleration here and then it gradually dies out. If you just stand quite a ways back, it may look like a Gaussian function, but it, it really is a lot different from a Gaussian function. And, <clears throat> and a lot of people, when they make synthetic data, they will take a Gaussian function and do a second derivative of it to make a, second, make a, a source for their synthetic data. And if you take a second derivative of this function, it looks a lot different because there's only two blobs. The second derivative of a Gaussian function is the Ricker wavelet. There's three blobs. This one only has two blobs. How can that be? I thought if you took the second derivative of a blob, you had to get three blobs. Well, there is a third blob here, but it's really, really small. And that's because the second derivative out here is really, really small, whereas the second derivative in here is really, really big. So from a practical point of view, that kind of synthetic seismic source is Got the wrong number of blobs. <laughs> okay. Spatial deconvolution. Now we're going to, first thing we need to do is learn how to average over time and space. We're going to do t images. We're going to work with images now. So normally, we previously, we, we were updating our filter from a previous time point. But now we're going to be updating our filter from previous time points and previous space points. And the place we're going to be updating from, I'm going to call it A bar. So we're going to be updating our filter from a bar we'll be putting our delta a onto that okay so uh, this this here is lambda this lambda t there's a lambda t and a lambda x and those are distances on the time axis so this will be forming there's some kind of an average over i like to think of it as a rectangle although it's not exactly that shape and this will be a cos squared and this will be a sine squared so we have a weighted average of this here is a, a nice example that uh, Joseph Jennings did for me. Here's a bunch of bubbles in the uh, seismic data, and here it's been removed. And he, to do that, he used this gap filter. Joseph told me this only took him a cup, an hour or two. Nice. <laughs> okay, now we're going to look at a two-dimensional prediction error filter, and that's a little bit complicated. <clears throat> And I want to tell you some old knowledge about two-dimensional prediction error filters. The old knowledge is that it's in an appendix. Prediction error filters in two dimensions also have a white output. That's a little tricky, but it's explained there. And that's important. And the two-dimensional prediction error filter, here's a picture of one. It has a one on the diagonal and a couple of zeros underneath. So it's a little strange having the one on the, on the diagonal. And it also seems to require negative subscripts. OK, it's very easy to write the, the program for conjuring up a two-dimensional prediction error filter. Here's the program. These two lines just pass us and through the entire time and space axis, maybe time goes to infinity and maybe space does the same thing. Uh, there's a two, two loops here, two here, two here, and two here. Each one of these twos, two, 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 each one of these twos simply covers the entire filter. Okay, so that's what those loops do. And then let's look at this. 
Well, this is almost the same thing we did in one dimension with time. It is the same thing that we did in time. And it just says, do the same thing again in space. TL is lag in time. I guess I, I call that tau later. And now I need, uh, can't call it tau anymore because we also have the same thing in X. It's not X1, it's X, XL, the lag in tau. Okay, so this updates the residual. Then we take the residual and we plop it in here. What was an output becomes an input. And, and the filter space, which was an input, becomes the perturbation filter space as an output. Okay, that's the obvious story of the edge. That's how we do edge joints. The next thing we need to do is make sure these coefficients here are constrained. We don't want to apply, the, we don't want to let those change. We computed something to change here and we don't want to use it. So that's what this does. It removes those coefficients, the perturbation of those coefficients. And the last thing to do is simply subtract the, <laughs> subtract the, the filter uh, perturbation. Okay, so that's easy to code. Now let's let's talk about what it means. 2D PEFs can be used to destroy plane waves and it can use, be used to build plane waves. Now, I have this little sample here and this little sample has a one in it here and that's the one that has to be there. And it also has a minus one here and that minus one can be moved around and put in other places. Or what you can do with a minus one is you can put a half here and half there. Half here and half there. You, you can move it around here. And as you try all possible positions for that for that minus one, you discover that you are this thing will destroy, as it's shown here, it'll destroy this plane wave that, that's going through here. And as you move this one to other locations, well, it can destroy this plane wave, and it can destroy really all plane waves. You can think of all angles of planes. All, all lines can be destroyed. Uh, when newcomers look at this field, they somehow think, oh, shouldn't that one be up in the corner? Isn't that what a prediction error filter should do? But the answer is no, because if the one, if the plus one was put in a corner, you'd be able to destroy this slope and this slope and this slope, but you would not be able to destroy this slope. Here's the slope that you could not destroy if the one was in the corner. Okay, so you wouldn't get a full range of angles. After a PEF is known, it may be used to fill in missing data. That's what we did on page five, except here, we would just be doing it in two-dimensional space instead of one-dimensional space. If we use this, if we, when we apply this filter to data, it destroys that angle. But if we use this PEF in a missing data problem, it creates this angle of propagation for the missing data. Isn't that nice? This is all the data that the ship could collect in one day, and here we've just filled it in what it might have recorded had it continued to run. The next thing I want to talk about is why 2D PEFs make, take gradients and improve them, okay? So let's have a look at this shot gather. This is a shot gather, marine shot gather. And you study this a while and you say, oh, well, we got some strong reflectors in here. But there's some very weak backscatters coming along. You see this backscatter? I think you can see these. They're like little hyperbolics in here. Their tops, tops are somehow attached. Somehow those hyperbolics are attached to this arrival. So there's some complexity to this structure here. Now, if we apply a 2D PEF, as we are doing here, here's a 2D PEF. Uh, what happens is the backscatters get much stronger. In fact, the backscatters are about the same strength as the forward scatters. Making the spectrum white has the effect of making all the dips the same strength. <laughs> and in this case, the FEF isn't very big, so it couldn't make everything totally white. It's not white noise here. But with the amount of coefficients it had, all it could do is make these two slopes the same strength. Look what happens. If, if the residual continues to look like this, you'll have many iterations while you're trying to fit everything along the along this first break. And eventually you start to get things fit along this uh, event. And then and then once then the residual starts to get weaker and weaker at this event, and then you'll start to see the, the weaker events in here. 
So as somebody dealing with this would, using this for their gradients, would be seeing these events right from the beginning. Now, I must say I am disappointed that I'm not aware of any formal tests by all the inversion theorists out there, which test the assertion that PEFs improve the bottle fitting. Now, it doesn't really need a test because everyone in statistics asserts that. What, what is <laughs> not tested is Clairbaut's assertion that you'll get the solution faster. Imagine you took all these spikes here and summed onto hyperbolas or something like that. You'd get quite a mess, wouldn't you? Now, if you went over here and, and started summing hyperbolas, well, you'd get something and it would be more sensible. What we have here on the right is simply an, in, it's simply an interpolation of what we have on the left. But it's a very clever interpolation. You'll notice that things are aliased not only <laughs> before <laughs> interpolation, they're even aliased after interpolation, a three to one interpolation. So how did, how did this magical thing come about? And it's going to be exciting to realize that we can get it very simply now. It could be that it was too complicated for people back then, but it could really be that people would really have, would rather have curved surfaces here because we typically deal with hyperbolics in seismology. And that's what we can do now with a non-stationarity. We can make these things non-hyperbolic. Uh, um, okay, so I'm gonna now describe how this worked. Okay, so you start with a, a, a prediction error filter. There's a bunch of coefficients and I'll spread them very wide apart. And you can put this on the left side of the screen and then you can move this all around on the left side of the screen and you can use uh, you can figure out what coefficients should be there to minimize the energy out on the left side of the screen. And then what you do is you start compressing the coefficients. Uh, there's a word for this. Dilation and inverse dilation. You compress the coefficients till they're smaller and then you sit them down on the right side of the screen and then you start moving around there and you find the missing data. Now, I shouldn't say we find the missing data. Actually, we start from the missing data and as we move around, we're updating the missing data. Here we have, what do we have here? Equation one, and they're line, line one in the code. Well, there's some loops over all space and loops everywhere over the filter. I'm not gonna write those all those loops out. But line one is just the thing we've seen already. This, this came out of the prediction error program a couple of pages back. Now, dilating the PEF, the PEF looks the same in here, but it's dilated because the, the twos here, it's spreading, it's spread out. It jumps, it, it, it leaps over the data, <laughs> it leaps over channels. Those twos make it ignore every other channel. So now we've got two prediction residuals. One is the uh, ordinary one and one is the dilated PEF. Well, now, and then we, we can take these two residuals and we can use these two residuals to, here we're using the two residuals to update the filter. Okay, you, you can update it with either one. Either one of those will do to update the filter. Now let's have a look at the missing data problem. Okay, so we need to use everything up above. We need to have, have in other words, we need to have prediction error filters and dilated and non-dilated. And now we're going to, only where the data is missing, we're going to change it. These things here will get changed where the data is missing. Line two uses long legs to reach out to make a residual for a sparse filter. <clears throat> line four updates the filter. Line five <clears throat> asks us for the dilation invariance assumption R1 equals R2. And then it switches to the dense filter. Presuming the data and the residual are known everywhere, and we're going to make that assumption because we're going to start from zeros if they're not known. Presuming the data and the residuals are known everywhere, line five updates the missing data, updates data where it's missing. I explain to people how to do that code and I tell them to do it themselves and we're going to call that the geostatistics code. Chapter three, vector valued signals. A vector valued signal is a, like a three component seismograph or something like that. The idea of deconvolution is going to apply here. What we have on top, it describes the things that people have been doing from time immemorial for 50 years or more 
in seismology, they assume they have that there is out in the world an unknowable white signal, like maybe reflection coefficients as a function of depth in the Earth are positive and negative reflection coefficients are random. And somehow that picks up a wavelet, our seismic wavelet, that we, we create when we set our guns down and fire uh, energy into the Earth. And what comes back is these observations. Then we use a computer to design a prediction error filter, and what comes out is white. Now we notice that this one's white and that's one white, so we hope for the best. The prediction error filter part is going to be a matrix full of filters. So here's the prediction error filter in here. We presume that there was something similar to this, a crossover filter, out in nature. Filter them and mix them. And the angle, the angle of the wave decided how to mix them. Maybe you have nodes on that water bottom. And there's a downcoming wave. Call this one the downcoming wave. And then there's an upcoming wave. And things get filtered and mixed, and finally we have, this is what you record on your pressure gauge, and this is what you record on your vertical seismograph, okay? So now we want to unscramble that, and uh, so what we're going to do is make a white output. Now if there was a white input, and we've got a white output, we've designed this filter, then this filter should be its inverse. And it might not be. It will not be if there's some delay. If Y1 and Y2 are recorded in two different places, we're in trouble. Make sure that <laughs> that geophone and that, uh, that pressure meter were in the same place. It's just like the minimum phase assumption that we always had is still here. The program amounts to simply this. Where we had a 1 in the filter, Every PEF, scalar PEF has a 1. Here we'll have an identity matrix for that 1. So that's easy. Now, this part here is the forward modeling. So this is easy. It does all times, does all lags. And it, here's, this ICJC is a matrix subscript. So this code is nothing but a matrix full of filters, a matrix full of filters. And we know how to do the adjoint. And here's the adjoint. So wow. this. This, this worked the first time. I, I struggled to understand this while I was trying to think of taking the derivative of a penalty function with respect to a matrix filter. Oh, man. But once I said, oh, don't think of it the hard way, just say, oh, we'll do the forward modeling. It's easy to do the adjoint. All we have to do is put the residual into the adjoint, and we're done. OK, so this actually worked. As I said, it worked the first time. Here's uh, Kai, Kai Wen's first test case. By the way, I should say, tell you who Kai Wen is. She's working in our earthquake department, and I was really pleased she came to work with me because the SEP students didn't seem to want to. So this is the synthetic data we took. All the P waves are positive, and the S waves, they're lower frequency, and they alternate in polarity. Here's an S, S wave arrival, S wave, S wave, S wave. OK, so we ran this program. And the first time, as I say, it worked. Uh, it takes a little while for the S waves to catch on that they're supposed to be making spikes, but eventually they do. So, so it was delightful that this is what happened. So I said, let's try more realistic looking examples. And uh, here we have one, a vertical here and a horizontal there. And the vertical is higher frequency. This one here is higher frequency than the horizontal. And we're going to decompose it into a pressure wave and a shear wave. Now, there's two signals present in here. One is the original signal, and the other is the, the signal after our estimate of the original signal. And there are dots. And when the vertical line and the dot align exactly, well, that means you've got an exact fit. You did it perfectly well. And uh, in between, there's I think there's three, three zero value, three value, th Three points in a row, two or three points in a row, the signal is zero valued. So where it's zero valued, you should have dots on the horizontal axis. And when you look in here carefully, you'll see, oh, they're not on the zero axis. So there is there is a steady error in here, which isn't terribly big. OK, let's go on to chapter four. Chapter four is universal problems in geophysics. 
Now, a great many people in geophysics approach the inverse problems, people like Bill Symes, for example, just to pick on one of my friends. They say, let's, let's just make this really easy. Let's have a linear inverse problem. There's a function of a model, or a matrix times a model vector, subtract a data vector, you get a residual, you'd like the residual to vanish. Now, as I was saying, a great number of people will solve that problem and they will not think about a PEF. Whereas I keep telling people, you should do what the statisticians say, design, go ahead and design a PEF A. Okay, so let's look at what's involved. So you make this new quadratic form, which has got this A star A in the middle, and now we need to find the direction to go. And so we take the gradient, the derivative of E with respect to M, here we got the derivative of E with respect to M, and you get the answer, and we need to apply A star A to the residual. So from the residual, we know how to find A. All we need to do is apply A star. And we're hoping we don't have to save any filters or anything like that. And it turns out we don't. We don't have to, we're making zillions of filters, and we're not saving them. We don't need to save them. Th th this does it. This applies A star A, OK? Uh, the thing about this process is this approach has a great potential for streaming. With streaming, I mean that the entire data volume does not need to be kept in memory, that all the data flows through a box defined by the codes given herein. Well, that's true for the PEF, for applying a PEF, but if you're looking for missing data, you might have to pass through once, pass through again, pass through again. I don't know how many times you're going to have to pass through your data to fill in the missing data. Sorry about that. Missing data is a hard problem. OK, and we have to work at it. OK, the, the final one of the universal problems that I will discuss in this book is regridding. And what we have in this illustration, figure 4.1, is, is a real problem here that our receivers are not always uniformly placed on the Earth. In fact, we might try to put them on uniformly spaced, and often they're fairly close to uniformly spaced, but often there's just big gaps in them. And things are even worse than this picture because this picture only describes the receivers. There's also the shots, and the shots could be the same story. So we really have a five-dimensional space we have to deal with. And what I'm going to describe to you is only the, the three-dimensional space, and you can figure out how to do the five-dimensional space. So the kind of answer here for the three-dimensional space, I will read for you this caption, is we want to build a dense uniform grid on the Earth's surface plane. So up here, we're going to build a uniform grid. And from this grid, if we define the data correctly, we're going to make pseudo data on that grid. If we get everything working correctly, we'll be able to take linear interpolation. We'll take our observed data from the pseudo data. Well, it may not work perfectly, but we're going to try and do the best we can to get the real data off of the pseudo data. The pseudo data is going to be on the uniform mesh. So the method that I'm going to describe involves two things. You have to take a prediction error function filter and push it through the volume. And you take this prediction error filter and you push it through the volume that direction. OK, how many times we need to do this? I don't know. Well, but it, we should be able to handle multiple arriving events at the same time with this process, because prediction error filters are quite happy to deal with multiple plane waves at the same time. So part of the code we need here is going to be linear interpolation. You have a model, and you take the model, and you do linear interpolation off the model, and you see you should get the data. If you start with zeros, you won't get a good approximation, but it might work to start with zeros. OK, so, so now we got a residual. Now, what, what do we always do? We put residuals into adjoints. So we put the residual into the adjoint, the adjoint of linear interpolation. And that updates our model for us. With the updated model, we can now start looking for a PEF. And now we apply the PEF, and that updates the model again. So there's two stages of model update here. One of them uses data to expand the model. This is called data fitting. 
and the other the other one let's line, line the next line uses the PEF to shrink the model in other words regularizing supposing we're going to do a flat earth case then we know the PEF the PEF is just an X derivative uh, now let's learn the PEF well once we have a model we can always learn a PEF from the model so that's easy uh, Let's talk about flat earth regularization. Well, we just have to t take the gradient here and, and minimize that. And now let's talk about 3D locally constant dip. There could be several dips, regularization. Well, that simply involves two paths, one called A and one called B. Is this theory worthwhile? Is this really a universal problem in geophysics? Well, the fact is, it is not a universal problem. It is a universal problem for those of us who work on land and for those of us who work at sea, but it's not a problem for people that get their data from Earth satellites. It's hard for me to draw any conclusions because there's so many things that I've talked about here. We have dozens of conclusions. Okay, but you can find this booklet online and you'll get a, an updated version of it. If you search for this website, my classroom, John Clairbaut's classroom, and you look down here, this is my original book from four years ago. It has a lot of conjugate gradients problems solved in here. And this book is free online. You can download it from there. There it is, free online. Oh, that one's got lectures, 60 lectures. The whole, wow, look at this, all these lectures in here. Look, these are, averages 10 minutes. Uh, you can buy this book from the manufacturer for less than $12. Okay, here's the book that I'm talking about today, the booklet. I'm calling it a free booklet. It's still right here. Have a look. Here, here's today's booklet. You can see the cover. The cover looks nice. You can, you can find out what can you do with the methods that you get if you <laughs> study this book. Uh, you can see the video promotion of it, or you can buy this from the manufacturer. It's nice to have a coil bound book that lays down flat on the desk and you can mark it up with a pencil and that will cost you only $5.80 from the manufacturer. And the manuf if you press this button, you will go to the manufacturer's website. Okay, that's the story. I'm excited about it. I hope people follow it through. What do I want to do next? I'd like to get this thing on, on the web with Git so it'd be public, public software. And you can take this all away. And being 80 years old, maybe it's time for me to take a vacation. Okay, bye.